Well, hi everyone. It is an absolute uh, joy to be here. I'm also a proud citizen of the People's Republic of Tacoma Park. <laughs> uh, my name is Gabi Tayak, and I'm a Piscataway historian, committee engaged scholar. And I think for the course of this evening, what I'm most excited about is knowing Rebecca Nagel for so many years and watching you come into your voice further and further um, from the lands in Dublin, Missouri, up to Baltimore, standing up for the rights of uh, Native women and all women and all people, the land, and then taking a, you took a journey home um, to Talakwa, to your own, to your own nation that you, you know, you carried that fire for really and have through the course of your life. And so I'm just absolutely honored and delighted to be sitting here with you for this uh, story, you know, that you said lived within inside of your body. And you remarked in your book um, that you thought it was it was uh, selfish that there was a story that was residing, living in your body that had to come out. And I just want to tell you, it's not selfish. And I just wanted to <laughs> open that up with you and, and hear hear more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much. Gabby is a longtime friend and also just like a scholar and a leader and a community uh, organizer and somebody that I've looked up to for a really long time. So excited that we get to talk to each other. <laughs> um, and thanks everyone for coming out. It's so uh, great to see your smiling masks faces. <laughs> um, I appreciate everyone masking my last bout of COVID was one um, I really, really don't want to repeat. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the mask. Um, yeah, so uh, in the prologue, I talk about how um, the, you know, there were different reasons that I wrote this book. You know, I wrote this book because um, I, uh, you know, wanted folks to know the important story of this Supreme Court case and I wanted it to be well documented. I wrote this book because, you know, while people were litigating the case, they would say sort of dismissive things about the history like, oh, you know, bad things happened, but acting like it wasn't relevant to um, the land and treaty rights that were at stake in the case. And so, um, and then I also wrote the book <laughs> because, um, you know, part of the book talks about the Supreme Court case, but then a big part of the book is the story of my family. And so my ancestors made a controversial decision to sign Cherokee Nation's removal treaty, um, the Treaty of New Echota. They did that against the will and the government of the Cherokee people. And for that decision, they were assassinated. And it's a story that I've always grown up with. You know, the way my grandmother told me the story as a kid, they were heroes. You know, they had um, sacrificed their lives, given up their lives for Cherokee Nation. They were the reason that Cherokee still exists. You know, there was this other Cherokee leader, John Ross, who was this really bad guy, <laughs> according to my grandmother. Um, and it was actually like kind of at an embarrassingly older age that I was like, oh wait, like that's not the full story and that's not how the majority of Cherokee people see it. And one of the things that was really powerful about this book was being able to do a lot of research myself and come to my own adult conclusions about about that complicated history. Yeah, so really, I mean, where you said I was hoping you brought a selection also to read if you wanted to start with, let's hear a passage yeah. of the book and then we'll go back and talk about land, courts, life. Yeah, so, um, so the book covers a 2020 Supreme Court case that resulted in the largest restoration of tribal land in US history. And that decision was called McGirt v. Oklahoma. Um, and it affirmed the reservation of a tribe in Oklahoma called Muscogee Nation. And then after the Supreme Court ruled, lower courts interpreted that decision as upholding the reservations of other tribes in Oklahoma, including my tribe, Cherokee Nation, but also the Seminoles, Choctaws, and Chickasaws. And so um, the case actually started in a surprising place. It started as a murder in 1999. Um, and the man who was convicted was actually sentenced to death by the state of Oklahoma. And it was in the course of his death penalty appeals of just, you know, literally trying to save their client's life 
that his defense attorneys came up with this argument of like, wait a minute, actually Oklahoma didn't have the jurisdiction to prosecute this case in the first place because it happened on a reservation. And that question of whether or not Muscogee Nation still had a reservation went all the way to the Supreme Court. And there was a lot of worry that even though the law was on the tribe's side, that the tribe would still lose because the reservation hadn't been recognized in over 100 years. And a lot of times when tribes have a right in writing, but it upsets states or non-native people, um, that right isn't upheld. <laughs> so um, this reading is from uh, almost the end of the book, and it's the day that the Supreme Court case comes out. So the book kind of follows the case closely from the original crime up through the appeals and all the way to the Supreme Court. So this is dropping in, I'm like, at my desk, I'm like furiously hitting refresh, um, and then I click on the opinion and I read it. On the far end of the Trail of Tears was a promise. The opinion began. Forced to leave their ancestral lands in Georgia and Alabama, Creek Nation was given assurances that their new lands in the West would be secure forever. Today, we are asked whether the lands these treaties promised are still an American Indian reservation for the purposes of federal criminal law. Because, the government, because Congress has not said otherwise, we hold the government to its word. The first month of summer in Oklahoma was hot and dry. For weeks, rain was nowhere in sight. The lush weeds, wildflowers, and grass turned brown and crisp at their edges. Even the trees looked tired. That morning, the sky cracked open and it poured, a hard, pelting rain that pooled in the dirt. It was as if the earth knew. You can deny a people what is rightfully theirs for only so long. Eventually, something must give. That day, across eastern Oklahoma, tribal citizens celebrated the decision with joy and abundance. But it was a joy that also cut hard and deep. Our blood and our bones knew how much had been lost to reach this one act of justice. Chief Justice Roberts, who authored the dissent in the case, thought it was improbable that unbeknownst to anyone for the past century, a huge swath of Oklahoma is actually a Creek Indian reservation. But for Cheyenne and Muscogee elder, advocate and writer, Suzanne Harjo, in that century lies a lesson. Right page. <laughs> <laughs> Tribes have to keep asserting their sovereignty. There has to be Native people who keep saying, this is who we are, this is what we do, this is what we have responsibility for, these are rights that we have, she says, no matter what kind of trickery there has been to try and convince us otherwise. For Harjo, the McGirt decision is why Native people cannot be deterred by the losses we face, even when it is a century of loss. Because we're on a longer timeline anyways, she told me. We're just not on the same timeline as other peoples are in this country. We are on a much longer one, backwards and forwards. And a lot of things will get straightened out along the way because they're too blatant to stand. The history of tribal land in the United States has moved, for the most part, unforgivingly in one direction. Prior to July 9th, 2020, American Indian reservations made up only 2% of all land in the United States or about 56 million acres. For perspective, nearly 200 million acres is set aside for national forests. In the expansion of this great nation, our government set aside more land for trees than for indigenous people. The McGirt decision resulted in the largest restoration of tribal land in US history. Taken together, the five tribes' reservations cover 19 million acres, about half the land in Oklahoma and most of the city of Tulsa. It is an area larger than West Virginia and nine other U.S. states. The historic status of McGirt is ironic when you understand what happened legally. The Supreme Court didn't strike anything down, overturn anything, or change their own precedent. All the court did was follow the law, but still, that was radical. 
When it comes to tribal sovereignty, the U.S. government is spineless. <laughs> Most often when states or non-native people want something that belongs to a tribe, whether it's gold, oil, land, or power, they get it. Even when the law clearly protects the tribe. Greed, not justice, has governed more of our history than we are willing to admit. The lesson of McGurk is not that when the law is on our side and we fight really hard, justice prevails. The lesson is that although justice for indigenous nations is rare, in our democracy, it is possible. There is an easy mistake to make in telling the story of this case, which is to say that the reservation was given back to the tribe. This would be incorrect. Despite Oklahoma's position in the case, Despite everything that was taken away from our tribes, our reservations were never abolished. And you can't give back what already belongs to someone. In one of the darkest chapters of American history, this land was promised to us for as long as the grass grows or the water runs. In eastern Oklahoma, the grass is still growing, the water is still running, our fires still burn, and we are still here. And despite the grave injustice of history, our legal right to our land never ended. Thank you. Mm -hmm.